Stoke, and I would just like to begin by acknowledging the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of First Nations people across the province. We're really excited about the call today. We've got Leah Squantz, uh, who is the Acting Executive Director of Strategic Policy Initiatives in the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction, leading the Poverty Reduction Team. Welcome, Leah. Leah came to the ministry from a 20-year career in the labor movement and is thrilled to be applying her policy and advocacy skills to this important work. We also have Danita Welch here on the call today. Danita has worked at UBCM for many, many years um, in, in a variety of capacities. I've, I've come across Danita uh, you know, applying for, for a few different um, funding opportunities. And, but this is the first time that we have seen a funding opportunity specifically focused on poverty reduction. And so it's an exciting step forward and an exciting opportunity. I think without uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to Leah to introduce uh, the government's uh, poverty reduction planning and action grant. Um, if you can hear me, I will just jump right in um, and uh, I won't take too much time because I think everybody knows a fair bit about this program already. Uh, I'm sorry to keep you waiting while we sorted out those technical problems. Uh, so the Public Planning and Action Program. Oh, someone is, we're getting some background. Just remember to, if you're not speaking to mute your line. Thank you so much. Um, so the Poverty Reduction Planning and Action Program uh, arises from a $5 million grant from government to UBCM. Um, and UBCM is administering the program. And the idea behind it was to support local governments in reducing poverty at a local level. Uh, the minister, uh, Minister Simpson, has been clear um, for the last couple of years that poverty reduction is something that, that needs everybody in the province to work on together. It requires participation from all levels of government. It requires participation from community, from business, and from individuals. Um, and so this program was intended to support, uh, to support that and to provide an opportunity for local governments to access some funds to engage in some meaningful local action. Uh, and it was a response to many years of advocacy from local governments and community groups. Um, and just emerges from the recognition that, that poverty is still significant, poverty rates are still really significant in BC um, and that there was a need for policy and investment to address that. Uh, and I think probably most people on the call are fairly familiar with our strategy, but I'll just um, run through a couple of things really quickly because the, this program uh, is connected very deeply to the strategy and requires um, applications to to address the um, uh, at least one of the six priority action areas that are identified in the strategy and in our legislation. Uh, so the strategy itself, is, Together BC, is based on four guiding principles of affordability, opportunity, social inclusion, and reconciliation. And then the um, the strategy refers to the six priority action areas that are um, are in the legislation. And that's housing, families, children, and youth, education, employment, income supports, and social supports. And as I said, the uh, funding applications for this program require that the projects uh, be connected to at least one of those six. And I, I think Danita will probably answer more specific questions. So I'm going to leave it there, but I'm happy to ask, answer any questions as well. Great. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, oh, we'll just turn it directly over to Danita. Welcome, Danita. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? You bet. Perfect. Great. Um, following from um, Leah's introduction in terms of the, the provincial um, impetus behind working with UBCM to um, initiate this program, 
I thought what I would do is just review some of the key eligibility or, or program design elements of the program. Maybe take about five minutes to do that. Um, and then honestly, just open it up for questions. I think that's probably the best way to support communities that might be looking to submit applications. Um, and so if that works, that's, that was sort of what I had in mind for this morning. Um, in terms of, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to use the program guide as the template to walk through. Um, if you haven't already had a chance to look at that, always the best place to start for any of our funding programs um, available on our, on our website. Um, so generally speaking, at all, so I'll start at a very high level. So the programs available to local governments in BC, that's limited to municipalities and regional districts. Um, eligible projects, Leah already spoke to the priority areas. Um, so applications must be focused on at least one of those air priority action areas, but could be focused on multiple um, areas. Um, especially in the the planning um, stream one projects, um, we may well see that communities want to put together a, a fulsome poverty reduction plan, which would be looking at multiple um, areas that could be all six or it could be a combination of the of the six priority action areas. Um, we allow one year for projects to complete um, and that's from the date of approval. Um, it's not tied to a calendar year. Um, we certainly are looking for applications that, in, that can demonstrate partnerships. So um, throughout the program material, materials, we speak to partnerships um, in regards to community-based poverty reduction organizations, people with lived experience of poverty, businesses, local First Nations and or Indigenous organizations. Um, one piece we have with our funding, um, a number of our funding programs, is the concept of regional projects. Um, so that's a recognition that many areas of the province are already working in collaboration. So that could be, as an example, a regional district that's working with a number of its member municipalities on, on, poverty, on poverty reduction. It could be, um, you know, two or three municipalities that are, that are working closely together already. Um, you know, we're located in Victoria, so certainly the Capital Regional District is an example where side-by-side um, -side municipalities who are tackling issues regionally, um, and so that's, that's an opportunity we like to provide. In those cases, um, the funding maximum can be um, essentially multiplied based on the number of eligible applicants that join into a regional application capped at 150,000, and we do certainly expect that there would be cost efficiencies to working together. So we, we don't want to see just the multiplier effect of, well, we've got, um, you know, four communities at 25,000 each, so at $100,000. Um, and, and as with all of our applications, we do, um, we do look quite closely at the budgets. Um, we do expect cost efficient, we do expect cost effectiveness in all applications. In the case of regional applications, um, we do like to see a rationale and a demonstration of cost efficiencies when you have multiple applicants working together. Um, in terms of the funding streams, um, if any of you are familiar with our Age Friendly Communities program, this will look familiar. Um, we did base this program to some extent off the existing Age Friendly program. Um, stream one is, a, is a, essentially a planning stream. So we do want communities to be starting with plans and assessments to understand their regional context and also regional opportunities for advancing poverty reduction work. Um, I won't go over all of the, the, the potential um, eligible activities under the funding stream. Um, just sort of leave it to say that we, we're look with, with this being a brand new program, um, we're, we're a little bit more flexible looking to see what makes most sense for communities. Um, as I already said, that might be a, a fulsome plan that looks at multiple priority action areas. Um, and it also could be, um, you know, because we're supporting local governments, this could be an exercise of, of local government applicants looking at existing plans they already have. Um, using an official community plan as a, as a fairly obvious example and looking at that plan and perhaps applying to um, access some dollars to, to redo that plan or to revisit that plan from a poverty reduction lens. 
So um, to be clear, we're not attempting to um, subsidize routine planning efforts. So if a local government's already updating their zoning bylaw or their OCP, um, we're not going to subsidize that effort. But if they want to add an incremental component, which would be the poverty reduction lens, then that's something we could consider. Um, we're also um, interested in funding planning processes. So that could be sort of the, you know, the pre-planning stage where you're bringing stakeholders together um, to talk about, you know, what would make most sense for a plan. In terms of stream two, um, it is important to note that you, um, communities are required to either have a poverty reduction plan or assessment in place, or be able to demonstrate that one of their higher level plans like an OCP um, is already inclusive of poverty reduction principles. Um, so we want to see that the planning has happened. Um, and, and if that's able to be submitted, um, then the stream two, um, uh, up to $50,000 for single applicant. Um, and again, I mean, I think we're prepared to be quite flexible in terms of communities identifying for us what makes the most sense for their community in terms of actions for poverty reduction at a local level. We are, I mean, there are a number of examples in the program guide. Um, and it is, it also is very important to note that this is not a capital program. Um, and so, you know, if, if an example of um, a community kitchens are actually a fairly common example we see in our age friendly program that I expect might might have some some bearing to this program. So an interest in food security or um, providing food to people experiencing poverty. Um, so is a bit of a chicken and an egg. Can't do that unless you have a kitchen. Um, that's a, you know, a commercial kitchen. Um, that's able to support community um, projects like this. And so we are able to provide up to 25% of the requested grant towards capital costs, provided they're directly re related to the activities that you want to undertake. So following with the community kitchen example, you want to provide, um, Maybe it's going to be um, some training around working in a kitchen, um, providing um, opportunities for families and children to come together, share a meal. Um, so those activities or the costs related to that, that activity would be considered and you, you could apply for then up to 25% of the cost to update the kitchen itself or the building that the kitchen's in um, and able to directly support those activities. Um, so again, this is something that we have as a, as a concept and criteria in our age-friendly program. Most applicants understand it quite clearly, but there are moments when um, some communities um, have applied and, and they miss this piece. Um, and we do occasionally see, again, under that program, and I'm, I'm hoping not in this program, but I, I do like to flag it, we do occasionally see applications that are 100% capital. Um, and that's something we're not able to support under either of these funding programs. Um, and so just to keep that in mind, if you're looking at stream two for the poverty reduction action, not a capital program. Um, so please do not submit applications that are 100% um, capital requests. Um, in terms of ineligible activities, probably the last thing I'll speak to, um, and then maybe just have a quick um, overview of how we review applications. Um, so um, it's in the program guide. Again, um, things like feasibility studies, architectural drawings, sort of those, those design stage elements would not be eligible under this program. Um, you can see some of the other pieces there, infrastructure, capital, except for what we noted above. Um, I already spoke to the funding maximum, so 25000 for planning, 50000 for projects, um, actions with the uh, concept of regional projects. Deadline's not until February, so there's quite a bit of time. Um, I do always like to flag that our, our program officer who's responsible for this program, her name is Sasha, um, she is very happy to talk to applicants about applications before they come in. We can't screen draft applications because we simply don't have the time, um, but we certainly are open to conversations and ideas. So always feel free to, uh, to phone the, the number that's on the program guide and chat with Sasha or myself about any ideas you might have. And then I'm just gonna close off. I'm 
realizing I've spoken for more than five minutes, but um, just to close off, but just about how we review applications. So everything will come to UBCM. We screen all the applications to make sure they're complete and they're eligible. Um, so that would be generally that they've come from an eligible applicant and the activities that are being proposed are eligible. And then after that, we will be working um, with an evaluation committee. It's not been established yet, but generally speaking, it would be representative, uh, representatives from the, the ministry and potentially other subject matter experts working in the area of poverty reduction. We provide the criteria in the program guide so you have a sense of what we're going to score you against. Um, and then we work together as a committee. Um, every application does have a score that comes from a scoring process. But then we also look at um, other variables which are identified here, which include um, um, population and then um, distribution across the province. Um, and then we work together as a committee to, um, to make recommendations in terms of, of which applicants are successful um, under the intake. So I'll leave it there, but I'm, I'm certainly happy to stay on the line for a while to answer any questions that there might be. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Danita. We really appreciate the overview. So at this time, we'll open the floor up for questions. I would just encourage you, if you have a question, to please just jump in. Just remember to un unmute your line when you do want to speak and mute your line to make sure that we get no background noise when other people are speaking. I guess um, I have a question. I'm just wondering if one municipal, like a single municipality, could in put could put in two applications. One being a local application pertaining to their particular municipality, and the other being a regional application. No. So eligible applicants can submit one application per intake, um, and that includes participation as, in a regional application. So if, um, I mean, just to use a local example, if the city of Colwood wanted to submit an application on their own, they would not be eligible to participate in a regional application that was potentially submit, submitted by the Capital Regional District. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Are there any other burning? I've, I've, got a, I've got a quick question, just as a, as a, as a follow-up from that. Um, so I live in, um, you know, I live in the Lower Columbia, and um, in the regional district of Kootenai Boundary, I'm hoping that the regional district will be putting in a, an application for Stream 1 funding um, for developing a poverty reduction plan in Grand Forks, um, but we're also part of the same municipal, the same regional district here. So, if the municipalities here got together to do um, a joint application for Stream Two funding, would that be a problem? Um, just so I'm understanding, would the the planning effort being done by the regional district? Yes. Um, but would that be the plan for your area? No, it would be. Okay. So, so this is actually a monster regional district. So th yep. the stream one funding would likely be for the boundary area. Okay. And the stream two funding would be for the western side of the, okay. of the area in the lower Columbia. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like that would be fine. I mean, essentially, we can't have, you know, one local government show up in more than one application. Right, okay, so that, that wouldn't be the case. It would just be yep. the regional district who represents the, the local municipalities here, but mm -hmm. they would be look, the, the application would be focused on an entirely different area of the province. Yep, that sounds like it would be fine. Okay, perfect, thanks. You're welcome. I have a Hello, question. April from, oh, you go ahead, I'll ask after. Okay, it's Anne from Williams Lake. I'm curious about um, in the in the project itself. Does the municipal or local government need to take the lead on the project, 
or in the partnership, can the municipal government um, hold the contract and be the, the applicant, but partner with a community organization who would actually take the lead on the project? Our expectation is almost is the same as my question. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, okay. Um, again, our experience in the age-friendly program, I, I'm expecting to be very similar to this one um, in that many sort of third-party organizations, community groups um, end up being the ones who take the lead for the project, and that's fine. Um, at the end of the day, um, UBCM would have the granting relationship with the local government. The local government would be 100% 100% responsible for the grant and all of the grant requirements, um, including the final reporting. Um, but if they opted to work with um, a community group, and that community group becomes the primary entity, sort of. Um, delivering either the project or, or overseeing the planning process, that's fine. Um, a local government is not able to um, allow or, or UBCM wouldn't allow that third party to, to submit reporting or to receive the grant funding directly. That would still remain the local government's obligation. Right. Okay. Thank you. Avro, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I think that actually answered my question. I was wondering the same thing on a regional level. So it sounds like for um, the lower mainland um, the region, Metro Vancouver would have to do the application or like be the, the main applicant. Is that correct? And then the, the nonprofit that's actually say it's the second the second stream, um, the the nonprofit that's been working on that project area um, wouldn't be the the direct recipient, even though they'd be the main lead on the project. I Correct. That answers my question. Okay. I think that's where the partnership comes in. Anything, anyone else? Uh, Sarah from Whistler. Um, I'm just wondering if this is something that might be uh, available again in future years. If you were to do like stream one funding this year, is it, um, does it look like there's going to be stream two available in pre um, following years? We don't know. Um, it's a, it was a $5 million contribution um, with the intent of it being a three-year program, but we, we never know how many applications we'll receive. Um, and so if, for whatever reason, we end up with 100 eligible applications in front of us and that's um, going to use up the bulk of the money, then, you know, that's a, that's a potential scenario. It could be that we only have 25 applications and we'll run a, a complete 2020 program next year. So it's, it's funding permitting um, in terms of how much of the, the 5 million that's made available to this program is um, committed to the first intake. Okay. I would be surprised if we committed the full 5 million in the first intake, um, but you never know. I mean, I've got a funding program right now that just received almost 200 applications in a single intake. And so you never know what's gonna happen. <laughs> No kidding. Uh, we do have a question in the chat box from Lori. Um, is there research support available in writing proposals? In in writing the proposals, for example, statistics on poverty levels around the province, best practices in priority areas, and the like. Leah, are you still on the line? Could you answer that? Uh, I am on the line. Uh, I don't know that that was contemplated when we designed the program. Um, so I would need, uh, I think we would need to follow up with you about that. Great, thanks. And I know that one of the things uh, that uh, Tamarack and the city, Cities Reducing Poverty Initiative is working on is just looking at how they can also support um, proposals that are, are going in. Alison, do you want to speak to that at all? 
Yeah, um, and, and we will go into that as part of the discussion following this part of the call. But yeah, there's definitely some big buckets of learning that, that Tamarack is able to support with, whether it's the developing the community plans, engagement of business and people with lived experience, um, the evaluation, like you said, painting the picture of poverty in your community. Um, and so I'm really interested as part of this call, noting that we have a few months between now and the deadline and noting also that there'll be quite a few community based poverty reduction initiatives that aren't yet well connected their with their municipalities who may need to start this process by making the case and building building those relationships. Um, I'm really interested in um, learning what, what, is the what are the best ways that Tamarack can support uh, with the learning um, mediums that we have available to us and really with the intention of supporting as many communities across the province uh, to receive this funding because it really is, you know, it's, it's, it is the first time in Canada that this, fund this type of funding has been available and I think it's just so important um, and so there's a lot of great work happening within the province and the more that we can connect people with each other and people with resources and tools uh, to help, um, you know, make sure that those projects are eligible and help you plan for them and roll them out. Um, looking forward to that conversation on, on what we can do. That's great. Thank you so much, Alison. I have another question as well. Um, I'm just wondering if a municipality uh, can utilize this opportunity to support the development of related bylaws, policies, and procedures. Could you give an example? Affordable housing. Hmm. Well, um, Leah, you can certainly jump in if you if you think I'm not answering this correctly, but my sense would be is if we received an application focused on housing as the priority action area and looking to um, looking under stream one looking to you know amend or um, revise in an existing policy as it may relate to you know a neighborhood plan a community plan the ocp the portions there in relating to affordable housing, I I don't know why we why we wouldn't consider that. Um, we also um, certainly have um, an understanding and an expectation that um, applications that um, are predicated on social determinants of health, in which we specifically speak to affordable housing in the program guide. Would be would be considered again pr provided they're focused on one of the six um, priority areas. But that would be considered stream one rather than stream two. I guess it would depend on the application, actually. Yeah, I mean, I, so I just assume that would be stream one. Um, stream two, I'm not entirely sure what fifty thousand dollars in a non-capital funding program is going to do for affordable housing. But if there was, you know, an idea that came forward, um, you know, honestly, I, th I think we're, we're looking forward to being pleasantly surprised by what we receive for um, as ideas for funding. When we have new funding programs and we've had the, um, you know, the, the good problem of having many new funding programs here in the last few years, the first intakes are always are always quite delightful in that aspect. You just don't know what communities are going to apply for. Um, and so I, I think there is, I think the program design is intentionally flexible um, and, you know, provided some of the key eligibility criteria are met. Um, I think there's a fair amount of opportunities for communities to tell us in stream one and stream two, what is most important to their community and what would have the most impact at a local level for reducing poverty. That sounds great. I think it, you know, it sounds like it's going to be really flexible and, you know, everything is so uh, pertains so much to the local context. So in every community, that context is different. So, yeah, I'm sure it, you'll, you'll get some interesting applications. Does <laughs> anyone uh, else have any burning questions for Danita? 
It's Anne in Williams Lake. I do have one more burning question. Um, and it's around the requirement for sustainability. I wonder if you could speak to what your expectations, this is often a requirement in projects, um, and it can be a bit vague, I have to say. Um, so I'm just curious if you can speak to what your expectations are around uh, sustaining a project. Um, is this based on what's on the application form? Is that where you're? I'm looking at the slide that's up about the program. Um, so to have a plan to, to have a plan the project beyond the one year funding cycle um, so depending if it's if it's planning or um, a project and so in in planning streams um, you know we like to see that applicants and again I'm, I mean I'm given this is brand new and I've never seen applications under this program. So based on our experience with the age friendly program, we like to see applicants have a clear understanding that they're going to do this planning process and the, the outcomes of that planning process um, would be, would be potentially captured in things like an OCP or a zoning bylaw or an affordable housing policy so that there's some kind of, of teeth essentially within the in the regulatory world or the the bylaw world of that local government so that it doesn't just become another shelf another plan that sits on a shelf um, in the project funding stream or the action funding stream um, we we like to see that there's you know thought being given and we understand that at the application stage you know you don't know what the outcomes are going to be um, but we like to see that thought has been given to um, you know, if, if a program is successful, how the applicant or, or the, the community groups they're working with um, would consider continuing it in the, pro, in the community. So, you know, if it's something like, um, trying to think, so in the program guide, we speak to um, the ability to, um, where is it? There's one about, yeah, reduced transit fare. So as an example or a, a recreation passes. So a local government applies to do reduced um, recreation passes for people experiencing poverty. So we do that for a year. It's a great success in the community. Um, how would that be sustained? And so we, again, we don't need you know, a detailed plan, but we want to see that, you're, that the local government is thinking towards that. So that could be in the budgeting process. Um, that could be in potentially looking at other funding sources. Um, that could be perhaps um, how even at a, at a reduced cost, how those fees that are ultimately paid for those services are returned to future, to future programming. Um, so it's, again, we're not expecting a, um, you know, a bulletproof plan for sustaining the effort. Um, but we're, we're, what we're looking for in both the planning and the, the, the action funding stream is that thought is being given to outcomes and if those outcomes are positive, how a community may be able to maintain that momentum or, or maintain that service delivery. That's great. Thanks, Danita. Mm -hmm. So I think this has been very helpful. I think that it's uh, almost uh, 20 to 11, so it'd be good to, I know that Allison would like to speak with you a little bit more about what learning supports are needed from Tamarack and the Cities Reducing Poverty Peer Learning Network to best support municipalities mm -hmm. to plan for and prepare for their applications. So, Alison, do you want to speak a little bit more to this? Sure. Um, just before, I did just see that uh, Trish Garner had typed into the chat box one last question. I wonder if we could okay. address that one as well. Great, thanks. So, given that many of the systemic issues underlying poverty require provincial policy change, will you be funding projects that build provincial advocacy at the community level. Mm 
I guess this could be for Danita or Leah. It's Danita. I would I, I need to understand more what provincial advocacy at the community level means. Are you a labor, a, able to elaborate at all, Trish? I'm not sure if Trish is connected to audio, but it, I, I believe from the first part of the question that it's around advocacy for changes in provincial policy. I mean, I guess I would say that's potentially an outcome of some of the projects we might fund if, if an applicant chooses to take the learnings or the, you know, hopefully the success of a, of a planning or, um, or project, um, project um, forward as, you know, take it to their, their local um, MLA or to the ministry. Um, it's, I would say it's, it's not something that's considered in the program design. Um, and then it, it also means that we don't, oh, sorry, there's some more information here. It means the private local community to raise their voice in advocating. Um, yeah, so again, I mean, it, it's potential that that's an outcome. Um, our, our grant programs are not intended to be um, sort of fundraising platforms. Um, and so if, if the notion is to take a project that we fund and present it back to the province for sort of a, a, a local additional dollars at the local level, that's, that's not something that we're, that we generally intend. Um, but I'd say, you know, across all of the funding programs we administer, local outcomes can always be learning that, that can be taken back to, to, to provincial or even federal governments, depending on jurisdiction for, um, uh, you know, for ultimate policy change, but I, I wouldn't say that's intended to happen through our program. Um, the the ministry will receive um, copies of of all the application materials as well as all the final report materials um, that are required through the program, um, and depending on on how they choose to use those materials, I'm thinking more particular to the final report materials. Um, I suppose there's always an opportunity there for um, for provincial policy change, but I mean that would be more the ministry's um, end uh, end to speak to. So, Leah, I don't know if you want to correct what I've said or or add something else. No, I I think you've captured it, Danita. I mean the the program is intended for planning and action by local governments um, or local governments in partnership with community groups. It wasn't intended. To, um, to, to fund advocacy programs. It was intended to fund action programs. So, um, so I, I, think, I think Danita's point that, that that could be an outcome of a project is, is a good one. And certainly we will, uh, we will wait with great interest to read both the applications and the final reports. Um, yeah. Well, and perhaps this type of thing might be captured, for example, when uh, municipalities that have yet to undertake the development of poverty reduction strategies, if they, you know, if they really dig deep into their communities and uh, hear from the, the voices of people with living experience, and, uh, you know, and, and then that information can be, you know, used to kind of uh, educate and perhaps support advocacy at the provincial level i think that you know this uh, could potentially could be a great uh, way kind of a conduit for that uh, on the ground experience to really be um, framed in, in in a positive way to to higher levels of government it's a good opportunity to get the ear to the ground for higher levels of provincial of, of government as well I know that when we did our poverty reduction strategy here in Revelstoke, we definitely found that, you know, people who are on income assistance and disability assistance definitely are living in deep poverty. But I think that um, 
if there's is are there any last questions before we move to Allison? Great, thank you so much, Leah and Danita. I think that was and that was some really great information. And thanks for the great questions from participants as well. I feel like I have a much clearer sense of of what this funding stream is going to look like, and and I have some new ideas around how Tamarack can support. Um, so as part of this discussion, what I thought I would do is just give a quick overview of the learning of our learning community, because I know there's a few people on the line who are not yet connected with the network. Um, so these are some of my initial thoughts that came to mind as I read through the grant of the buckets of, of areas of support. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what would be most helpful. Um, for a bit of context, um, so vibrant communities, cities reducing poverty, learning community, we have 80 members now across Canada representing just over 300 municipalities um, and each of these communities are involved in a comprehensive multi-sectoral collaborative um, poverty reduction work with a focus on poverty reduction and, el and um, elimination. Um, if you go to the next slide, Hannah. Um, some of the ways that we support our membership. Um, we have coaching, so each member has um, is connected with a manager of cities for one-on-one -on -one support. Um, expert coaching, that's with our directors. So for example, Paul Bourne is working with a number of communities in an intensive way by monthly phone calls to help um, build community engagement and work towards a common agenda and a community plan. Uh, so as far as stream one of the grant application, that would be a really good fit for those who are looking for that more um, targeted support on a timeline where over a 12 to 18 month process you're developing that community plan um, and, and especially a common agenda so it's really community driven. Um, one of the biggest strengths of the network is the peer learning. Um, so, you know, recognizing that there's some really great work happening across BC and across Canada. Uh, we bring members together through community of communities of practice like this one. Um, we just started a rural community of practice um, as our rural membership grows. Um, we, we run peer input process sessions, so if a member has a question or they're grappling with an issue, we can bring together a, a small group of eight to 10 people uh, to discuss that and brainstorm. Face-to-face um, -face events, we do a gathering or a summit every year. So next year we're hosting um, a big national poverty reduction summit in Calgary in October. Um, and that's a really good way for members to connect with each other, um, to learn through um, the keynotes, evening activities, workshops, uh, master classes, and so forth. Um, the online learning and publications, um, that's open uh, to everyone, uh, to the public. Um, so our website, the public webinars, we host our newsletter, um, social media, we try to share learning and you know where what's, ha what's happening in poverty reduction across the country, we try to curate that for membership. Um, and publications, um, case studies, so uh, it was mentioned in the chat box around what's working, what are some of these um, success stories. Um, we put tools together, guides, articles. Um, one thing that I'm, I'm working towards for December is to put together an initial article, which will also be a compendium of resources. So looking at this grant, and then what are the top resources under um, a number of areas that might be most helpful if you're getting started in this work. I'm going to the next slide. Um, so these are some of the buckets of learning I mentioned that might be helpful to members from my perspective. So that engaging, uh, engaging local governments, who are your local champions? How do you make the case? How do you build buy-in um, for the issue? 
uh, multi-sectoral collaboration. So Tamarack's work is really ingrained in a collective impact approach. Um, so collaborative leadership, community engagement, um, and especially engaging across sectors. So we always speak to the four sectors as being equally important, um, government, nonprofit, people with lived and living experience and business sector. Um, and for this grant, um, I was really happy to see that there was a note around um, including funding inclusion. So um, compensation for engaging people with lived and living experience in the work. Um, how do you do that compensation? How do you do, um, uh, so that's, that's definitely something that we can support with. Evaluation is always a tricky one, I think, for uh, smaller nonprofits um, and even local governments with limited capacity. So how do you source the local data? How do you tell the story of local poverty? How do you move from tracking um, outputs of the work, like the number of people uh, involved, and how do you go beyond that to show what is, what, what's the effect on what, what are families experiencing at the local level? And even beyond that, how do you connect your work to population level outcomes? Um, and sustainability as well. I appreciated that clarification around what the expectation is. We know that we're often working in, especially in BC, we're working with uh, time limited grant opportunities that are often project specific. Um, so how do we how do we build sustainability into that type of funding? Um, I think this this program is a great start, even the opportunity to fund uh, the development of plans, because I know that's that's a hard thing to find funding for. And the next slide, just the stream one and two supports. Um, I won't go into much detail here because I'd prefer to hear from, from you. Um, but as I mentioned, developing a community plan, we have a number of members involved in monthly coaching calls towards development of those plans in their community. And implementing the plan would be, um, I think we can be most helpful in connecting members with what, what's happening across BC and beyond what's working. And there's some really great examples in the grant application on what kind of uh, projects and, and implementation of the plans that, um, that's being sought. So we can, you know, if, if you have an idea um, for what you want to, what part of your plan you want to be implementing and you want to connect with others across the country that have done some really great work in that same area, we can make those connections. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, I'll, I'll pass it back to Jill for this, for this bit. I really wanted to hear what would be just hearing that and, and a bit of context, hearing Leah and Danita introduce the grant, what is it that would be most helpful from us? We really want to see as many communities as possible accessing this funding. So whether it's planning for preparing, submitting your grant application or rolling out um, the plan or the projects, what would be most helpful from Tamarack? Does anyone have any questions for Alison? Thanks, Hi, Allison. It's oh, hello. Hi, yeah. Allison. It's Margie Lesko from Nelsnet's Best. Thank you so much for hosting today and preparing this. Um, I do have a question. I'm interested in finding out, um, or I think one of the areas that we'd appreciate some support in would be making the case uh, to our local municipality um, for submitting uh, an application, and then actually uh, in the uh, planning process. Um, uh, whether there's anything available to um, ideas on how to structure the planning process and to develop a community poverty reduction plan. Uh, yeah, in terms of sort of what's best practice for um, maybe is it a social, uh, in terms of setting up a steering committee and, um, and how the structure might be, what a best practice structure would be for developing a community poverty reduction plan. So those are sort of the two areas that I think um, we would be interested in. Yeah, thanks for that, Margie. Um, yeah, and it, as a really quick overview, I'd say, and this is just based on experience supporting communities develop plans, um, other communities developing plans at the local level, I think, it, Definitely that support in um, meeting the preconditions of collective impact. So understanding the local context, recruiting local champions across the four sectors, um, 
building community will and finding that initial resourcing, you know, those are big milestones and the prerequisites really for collective impact uh, to work. Um, and then as we get into developing the plans or, you know, Paul's always speaking to, it's more important to develop a common agenda. So it's not a plan, you know, that's, that's rolled out top down. It's really driven by the community. And to do that, you need a really, really meaningful commu uh, community engagement over a long, a long period of time. Um, what we often find is members will start with a small leadership team um, from there. And then Jill could speak to this a little bit because she's at Rebel Stokes involved with the expert coaching process, but we work through a, a top 100 exercise who are your community influencers that are, are most important to engage in this process working towards a top 100 event where we bring everybody together um, and then really building out um, you know a listening team a data team and action teams that work over the next year so that by the time the plan is developed everybody's already on the same page and feels that sense of ownership knows where they fit in um, so you're, you're almost rolling out the plan through that through that process so the plan becomes an outcome of the engagement as opposed to the plan being you know rolled out and then asking people to sign on and I think too what's been really helpful is just the peer input process so finding out like particularly I think you know with the other um, communities that the, where where the municipality is ha, is is deeply engaged, you know how did that how did that happen, you know? Um, and I think that this is such a good opportunity because it's coming through UBCM and it's coming from uh, two municipalities. It's such an amazing opportunity for communities that have been working on the ground on poverty reduction like Nelson for many years to just uh, approach your municipality and, and deepen that relationship and, and, and deepen that level of engagement from the municipality. And I think that this, it, it almost kind of, just the, the funding stream itself just kind of sets the stage for deepening the relationship between municipalities and community groups and ensuring that poverty reduction makes it to the council table. I think that's so that kind of peer learning uh, opportunity through Tamarack has been really helpful for us anyhow as well. Does anyone else have any questions for Allison? No questions, but help. Um, I know the rural context was mentioned in the chat box and just wanted to note as well, Anne, Anne in Williams Lake's on the line and she's one of the, one of our two co-chairs, or Don's on the line as well, actually. Anne and Don are the co-chairs for our new rural community of practice. Um, they just hosted a call um, was last week, I believe, was the first rural COP call. So I think there's some opportunity uh, within that rural community of practice uh, to support members. We know that across BC, you know, it's a very different context. Um, and so having that specific rural support, it's, it's a, we've been asked, you know, over the last year, we're hearing it more and more, um, communities asking for rural specific supports. And I think we, we are starting to get some really good resources there and, and just being able to connect with other rural communities, I think it's going to be helpful. And we've got a comment here in the chat box, uh, from this Colleen at the city of Vancouver, that it would also be helpful to bounce ideas off you and help refine them together. You know, just, um, you know, how can, to, to really just make that case um, and make the application stronger based on the, you know, the, the vast kind of background knowledge that Tamarack has from across the country. The one-on-one -on -one brainstorming as well for pro project development would be helpful. Yeah, we definitely, definitely can do that, Colleen. 
So it looks like it's almost 11 o'clock. I would really like to thank everyone for being on the call today. Um, are just uh, again getting back to the cities re reducing poverty and our host for the meeting today, Tamarack. Um, I'll turn it over very briefly to Allison to talk about upcoming learning opportunities. Sure, will do. I just wanted to note as well, um, we'll be sending out the follow-up email and the recording to this call. So as you have ideas on learning supports, or if you wanted to connect directly, or you wanted me to connect you with other members, tools, resources that would support your application, don't, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, a few upcoming learning opportunities. Um, next week we have Cheryl Whiskey Jack uh, joining us on a public webinar, Authentic Engagement of People with Lived and Living Experience. Um, Cheryl's in, in Edmonton and going to be joining us. We're going to talk about how the power of collaborative efforts can be more impactful and how we can tackle deep-rooted social issues. Next week, we also have a discussion, um, a journey to understand participation and involvement. So this is with the Vancouver Foundation, um, and we're going to explore uh, how we can engage community to get input on an issue um, and understand how citizens feel about participating and being involved in community life. Uh, December 10th, we have, we are um, introducing our 2020 membership package for Cities Reducing Poverty. It's going to be quite similar to last year. Um, uh, again, it's going to include two free seats to the summit, which we're excited to, we know is happening in Calgary in October. Um, and this call is open to both uh, new members, um, colleagues that are already part of the network, and those who are interested in the network to understand what's included as part of the membership package and to, to distinguish between, between the public facing um, and the member related learning opportunities. And last, as I mentioned, save the date. We're really excited about partnering with the City of Calgary and Vibrant Communities Calgary, October 14th to 16th for the End of Poverty Conference. Uh, we have a commitment from Mayor Nanchi that he's going to be joining us. We're going to have uh, two and a half days of public learning and we're looking to also host a, uh, a member gathering for the evening before so everybody can reconnect and, and remember faces um, and set the stage for the event so save the date for that one thank you so much to everyone for joining us as i said please uh reply to, reply to me with any of your ideas i'm going to be putting together the initial uh, compendium of resources to support with this grant um, we will send you the notes and the recording from the call uh where we'll take a break over december over the holidays and reconvene for the community of practice on january 21st so look forward to seeing you all then and I can I guess I can already say happy holidays if we don't speak to you beforehand. Thanks so much Allison. Just a, an interesting side conversation going on in the chat box here about uh, just um, seeing if um, there could we could develop a platform at all for sharing of ideas around this. As uh, Leah noted the deadline for applications isn't until the end of February. So we do have some time to kind of work together. I'm sure there's going to be common themes. And uh, <coughs> so we'll, uh, we'll definitely um, follow up on that. So thanks, Trish, so much for the idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. Whether, you know, we do that as part of a call or we set something up online, um, definitely whatever would be most helpful Trish if you have any specific ideas on what the best platform would be but I agree um, I think the more we can support each other in this application the better. Awesome well thank you very much everyone for participating in the, in the uh, meeting today huge thanks to Leah from uh, the ministry and Danita from UBCM for uh, speaking to this really exciting funding opportunity for communities across the province. And I guess I'll say happy holidays as well. And we'll be talking shortly, I'm sure. Take care and goodbye. Thank you.